All right, welcome to Enterprise Grade WordPress Development. Um, building bulletproof plugins and themes that are ready for the masses. Uh, my name is Steven Word. I'm a WordPress core engineer at WP Engine out of Austin, Texas. Um, I did used to live here in Boston for a little bit. Uh, I missed you guys. Uh, we'll get more into that in a minute. Um, here is my who is record with the privacy turned off. Uh, not really, but um, I will throw this back up at the end if anybody needs my contact information. All right, so um, this is not a slide that I normally do, but um, I wanted to do it in Boston because um, I kind of consider Boston to be my WordPress home. Um, so I was born in Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, got my start into WordPress right around 2005. Um, did some freelancing for about seven years uh, via Florida and up to Boston. Um, I used to actually have like sleep disturbances and like that worked out really well for me. I was able to keep my own hours and whatnot. Um, but the day that I arrived in Boston, um, one of the things that was lacking from Florida um, was there wasn't really much of a WordPress community in the town that I was living in. So within 24 hours of being here in Boston, um, I jump on meetup.com, found you guys. Um, also found my employer in that same 24 hour period um, and joined a WordPress agency here um, in Boston, oomph. Um, love those guys too, they're down in Providence now. Um, and then I spent a couple years here. It's the first time I ever got on stage was here in Boston. Um, it's where I really kind of feel like I became equipped to give a talk on doing stuff uh, at scale or in the enterprise. Um, took a little heart round through San Francisco and now we're back at WP Engine in Austin, Texas. Um, I spend about half my time working on WordPress core um, and then other software engineering duties uh, throughout the week. So, what is enterprise grade WordPress development? What does that really need? Um, I think probably a lot of people equate it with scale, uh, but it's not just about serving a lot of pages really quickly. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, enterprise grade, so that would, I think of WordPress itself as probably being an enterprise level product. Um, now that I'm talking about core. Once you start extending it and doing different things with it, um, that kind of tails off a little bit. And we'll get into it, but there's a way to keep that level um, where you're able to serve uh, major media outlets, uh, major applications, things like this. And so what I want to do is I want to just kind of go over um, as many high-level concepts as I can uh, in this 30-minute slot. This is a very vast topic, so I am going to go fast. If anybody wants to catch me afterwards, that's totally cool. I realize I can't get into the weeds as much as I would like. Um, so these are the things that I think uh, make up an enterprise-grade software application, plugin or theme in WordPress. Um, following the best practices, right? If everybody's writing code to standards, um, it looks the same, it makes it more handoffable, you can interact with it. Um, it allows you to open the doors to things like linting. Um, you know, modern tooling is a very big part of this. Um, you should be considering using uh, the same type of development workflows and environments as the people you're collaborating with. Um, things like vagrants solve a very big problem because now you kind of get rid of that hey, this doesn't work on my machine type thing. Um, small piece, and then it gets more into using uh, code linting. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, that's a automated way to dig through your code. A machine runs through your code, parses it, and makes sure that it's following all those standards uh, that are outlined. Um, enterprise software is tested, and, and most of us are familiar with unit testing, um, but there's also lots of other different types of testing. Um, unit, I think, is probably the most important uh, for this audience. Um, there's also integration testing. You want to make sure that your application is interacting uh, with third-party vendors and applications. Um, so if you have like an interaction with Twitter, for example, when you push new code, you want to make sure that that's still working. And it's really hard to do that in a local environment. You almost have to do that um, in a testing environment. Um, Enterprise-grade software is extensible, uh, meaning that you add necessary filters and actions and things like this um, you internationalize, you do all the hard work. Um, a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about is really just good coding practices. It's, it's all available in uh, the WordPress developer documentation, um, but in aggregate, it becomes something amazing. Um, and then lastly, uh, scalable, um, we'll get into that later because that's a pretty heavy topic, but yeah, caching, uh, serving pages quickly, um, saving expensive calls. And then the last one, collaborative. Um, you know, keep in mind that you know, you're a single point of information, um, and most of us that are working on large-scale projects uh, rarely do that alone. Um, so make sure that you're facilitating uh, the conversation and doing the things um, to be collaborative. 
Um, so as I said earlier, this, this is a talk that I've wanted to give in, in Boston specifically for a long time. Um, and I just want to talk about the gems. Um, that map that I showed, uh, what that was really about is, is that I, I just want to highlight all the fun, cool, quirky stuff uh, that I've picked up over the last 10 years. And I hope that you know, even if some of this is um, not at your skill level, above or under, uh, that you walk away with, with at least one good thing. I'm also going to break a few rules of mine. Um, I typically do not put code uh, in my slides. Um, I'm going to try it here. I'm also going to do a live demo, and I'm relying on the internet. So being kind of taboo right now, but um, I don't know, first time for everything. OK, best practices. Uh, so best practices are basically coding standards for the most part. Um, you can follow this link. I've got it open in a tab here. I'm going to have to do a little tab juggling. Um, this is WordPress.org, um, best practices. Um, it talks about doing things uh, just in a very standard way, um, making sure that you're doing things like namespacing your functions so you're not colliding with other developers' efforts, um, following spacing and use of braces in the way that WordPress likes it to be done. Um, but this is actually really important to the enterprise because it makes code predictable. Um, you can look at code that's written to standards and understand it far more quickly than if you're trying to understand a developer uh, that wrote it in their own style. So unification is the, you know, the big takeaway there. So um, avoiding things like naming collisions. Um, like let's say that you were writing a, a plugin that, um, a Twitter widget. Don't call it Twitter widget. Call it Stevens underscore Twitter widget. Or maybe even better, Stephen Word's Twitter widget. Um, because someone else out there is probably going to write a Twitter widget. And if they try them both out, you're going to break a site. Um, unacceptable when you're trying to operate in, in a professional setting. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these things just because they're all in that guide. I'm going to go down to um, using WordPress methods and APIs. Um, this is one that I think is really, really important. Um, WordPress has all these built-in functions um, that don't get used. Um, WordPress core is the best part of WordPress from a scalability, uh, extensibility, like it's a good template. Um, so when you use things like database calls, like don't ever hit the database directly. Um, you always want to use WordPress's methods for querying the database. And the reason you want to do that is that it has mechanisms built in uh, for caching. Um, it has optimization routines in there. You're not going to be able to get that same level of performance um, if you're writing old PHP MySQL calls. Um, loading things conditionally is also relatively important. Um, what this means is just if you're writing a plugin, um, let's use the Twitter widget as an example, um, there's not really a good reason for that to load on um, the user edit page. So you, know, you can reduce the amount of load that you're putting on a server by only including things uh, when you need to include them. Um, like on the home page would be a very good place for that. Um, you also want to use boiler point, or, sorry, boilerplate starting points um, to create plugins and themes. Uh, it's also known as scaffolding. Um, basically what it does is you can type in a few parameters, and we'll go through this in a moment. And um, it will basically give you a directory that has uh, the correct um, like file organization. Um, it comes with unit test uh, folder and a sample test already included. Um, things like that. And then lastly, validize, sanitize, escape, all good best practices stuff. Uh, but it really, that one circles around security. Anything going in or out of the database needs to be clean and trusted. Um, and if you're showing something to um, not a client of mine, but let's just say like Time Magazine or something like that, um, this is really, really, really important because lots of people are going to try to exploit it. Um, anytime you put anything on the page, it needs to go through uh, escaping routines. All right, so those are a lot of rules. Um, let's talk about how we can uh, get the machine to help us uh, use this a little bit. Um, so modern tooling. Um, these are not what I, uh, they're not officially endorsed by the project. Um, this is the tool set that I happen to uh, really enjoy using. Um, and I'll kind of go over each one briefly and uh, give a few demos on some of this stuff. Um, and, but I want to kind of explain um, first what they are and why I like them. Um, so the first one is VVV, uh, stands for Varying Vagrant Vagrants. Um, this is that development environment we were talking about. Um, solves the problem of uh, mine is different than yours or it doesn't work on my machine. Uh, but there's lots of ways to get that, right? And, and VVV is not the only one. Um, what I love about VVV is that it's a Vagrant um, created by, um, I believe it was a 10 project, if I'm correct about that, before. Uh, 
they donated it to, or before it became uh, independent. Um, but what I love about VVV is that it, it was meant for WordPress development specifically. Um, so it comes bundled with all of these things, not only uh, present, but installed and configured. Um, WP CLI, um, just to kind of read the room, can I get it? Like, how many people use CLI like more than once a week? Okay, people are pretty familiar. Okay, um, so command line tools, um, it gets, it's expanding all the time. There's a lot of uh, really cool stuff in there. Um, namely, uh, so PHP CS, this is the, uh, the linter that I was talking about um, stands for PHP uh, code sniffs. You provide a rule set, which you can uh, comes with VVV, and after you write a plugin or as you're authoring, um, you can check this, and it will um, go through and tell you where your style mistakes are, or if you missed an escaping routine. Um, it's not just about enforcing formatting; um, it also catches some of those security type things, like if you miss uh, escaping HTML to a page or something like that, it'll catch it. Um, lesser known, but from the same family, is PHP CBF. I actually don't know what that stands for, um, but it, it's autocorrect. So it, it will, uh, it uses PHP CS, and rather than just reporting on what the problems were, it will fix them for you. Um, I know that doesn't sound trustworthy, but it hasn't broken on me yet. Um, still a little scared of it, but I don't know, it's cool. Um, PHP CS uh, also has integrations with most of the major IDEs, uh, so your, your code editor. Um, it can, if you install uh, PHP CS locally to your machine, not in the Vagrant, uh, you can connect it to your editor, um, and as you're actually like live coding, um, it will catch those things and give you an indicator um, if you made a mistake. Um, PHP unit and QUnit, um, that is the way that we do uh, most of our unit testing in WordPress, or I'd say all of it in core. Um, one for PHP, QUnit for JavaScript. Um, I like GitHub. I think it's probably the best place um, to do collaboration for um, specifically themes and plugins, and I'll get into more of that later. Um, it gets into the, the integrations. Um, and then lastly, Travis uh, CI, which is a uh, continuous testing environment. Um, this is where the whole thing really starts to come together, is um, before you push anything out to a, uh, to a customer, uh, you can run it through a test suite across multiple versions of PHP, Apache, Nginx, uh, different configurations, and you get a report, and it will block a deploy going out to the world. Um, a lot of people are kind of adverse, or, or when they first get into like testing, um, you know, there's a lot of overhead in getting this set up. Um, but the first time that it saves your butt and you don't get that phone call, it's totally worth all the time you invest. Um, let's see, I'm actually gonna go over to VVV real quick. Is that big enough in the back? Sorry, I thought I had that started already. And this is why I don't do live demos, right? Um, okay. Okay, so here we are in, um, so um, for those of you not using VVV, um, it does come with like three different versions of WordPress installed. You get um, basically the stable version and development version, which tracks uh, SVN trunk. Um, so it gets updated uh, pretty much constantly. Um, the one we're gonna use for this purpose is just the, um, the default one, so this would be 4.8. All right, and um, so this WP command, this is the uh, WP CLI that I had mentioned. Um, and what I want to do is kind of go through um, just a quick scaffold. So let's create a plugin. Um, and we're going to call it Hello Boston. All right. Now what that's done um, is it created plugin files for you. And so this gives you a running head start. Um, but it's more about the um, the testing and the, and the structure and stuff. Most of these files are uh, relatively empty. Okay, and there we have it. Um, hello, Boston. All right. Okay, so this is what you get. Um, this is how it starts off. Um, this is very dark, and I apologize. Uh, it's great out here. Um, but you get a 
script, a shell script for helping set up uh, your Travis integration. Um, you get this test folder, which is where a uh, unit test would live. Um, we'll get more into that later. Um, and then, you know, basically just your, you know, your plugin header, but it's all formatted and ready to go. Uh, so this plugin at this state is actually, um, you can activate it. You can run PHP unit against it. There are no tests in there. Um, but basically everything is ready to go. I mean, this is a, a great way to start a project. Um, Scaffold also does the same thing for themes. Um, I am more of a plugin developer, so uh, my apologies that the, the session is going to gravitate towards that a little bit. Um, but let's take a look at some actual practical examples. So on the plane right here, um, I did create a, uh, a plugin to demo with uh, while we're here today. Um, so I used the scaffold thing like we just saw, um, but then I flushed it out a little bit. Um, so the plugin I decided to author uh, without Wi-Fi because it was like, not able to work on the slides on the plane, um, it's this thing I'm calling uh, Boston of Fire. Very simple translation plugin. What it's going to do is translate uh, English into Boston speak. All right, so if we activate this plugin, you can now see that we have the Boston of Fire and the debug ba and users. All that, um, and this is now a wicked cool plugin. All right. All right, um, and the reason that I wanted to author this plugin is not just to make the joke, um, but I was trying to figure out a way that I could uh, illustrate um, a bite sized piece of code um, to not just be like, go use all these tools and do the things. I wanted you to see them run in and, and actually um, hopefully you wrap your head around what a very, very simple example of doing something um, with the intention of going large scale. So let's take a look at this, uh, this code a little bit. Uh, so this is a uh, scaffold out. Um, I have two subclasses here. The one that I want to uh, kind of point most of my attention to is this one called uh, translator. Um, so it's object oriented, which helps with naming collisions and things like that. Um, but it's very simple. Uh, you just have a series of very, very simple functions uh, that take an input and return an output. Um, this one in particular, replace ER with AH. I um, actually don't know which one is proper, so I went with both. And uh, car to car, right? Um, now, the thing that I really want to point out is, is that there is beautifully, uh, beauty and effectiveness in the simplicity of um, the way these functions are written. Um, they're very, very, very simple. Um, what this is going to help out with later is when you need to test this code, um, this is a very testable function um, called units. This is a testable unit. Um, so in PHP, for example, or I'm sorry, in PHP uh, unit, um, this is an example test. Um, these first two are just throwaways. Um, but this is what a test uh, that's addressing that function looks like. And you know, it's very simple. You provide it with an input, an, uh, an output, or what you're expecting to get back from that function. Um, you give your input to the function, and then you see if it's what you expect it to get back. Um, you want to write these things this way, because if you had a, a function that had 40 lines in it, um, testing this one behavior is going to have so many dependencies. Um, you're going to have to get into like mocking functions and a bunch of other things that are more complicated. Um, but if you can just keep it simple, um, it makes it development go faster um, and more predictable. Um, one of the points I'm going to speak to in a little bit, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of engineers are honestly too clever for their own good. Um, sometimes you're like, oh, I have a brilliant way to do this, and it's not actually always the best way. You can uh, make it harder to read. Um, sometimes, actually, things will just perform worse. Um, one of the things that I picked up uh, through working um, on some enterprise sites here in Boston was um, regex is slower than string replace almost every time. And you can solve like a great problem with it, and you can feel really clever. Um, but it's, it's hard to read. It's hard for someone else to, to look at really easily. Um, and something like just a string replace um, is going to like outperform that regex string like 10 to 1 sometimes. Um, might, might not seem like a big deal in a development environment. Um, you're serving a million page views. Um, those do add up, um, not just to time and experience, but also to server cost and other things. So, <clears throat> so with this uh, plugin, um, so uh, we are inside the Vagrant right now, and I've CD it into WP content. Oh, too small. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I can do that. Well, I think I could. Well, tell you what, I'll clear my buffer because for some reason that's not tracking right now. 
All right. Um, so what I can do straight out of the box after I've scaffolded that plugin, uh, I can do a couple of things. Um, first one, PHP code sniffer. Let's see if I did a good job of writing code. Um, what I'm typing in right now is this flag for standard. There's a couple of different uh, code sniffing standards that are available. Um, WordPress, just WordPress is the one that I usually use. There's also one for core. Um, there's also one for documentation, which is kind of good to do as a last pass. Uh, but we'll just go with WordPress for now. And those rules only apply to PHP files. So let's see what happened. All right. So um, I guess I did a good job because I have no errors. Um, let's create one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that and I'm going to replace it with a bunch of spaces and save and run it again. And then here, it tells me that I didn't follow standards. Um, simple report tells me line number. Um, and you know, once again, don't forget that like this doesn't have to be done in the command line. Uh, you know, I use Atom personally, Sublime I know also has packages. Most of the IDs uh, have a way to integrate this sort of thing. So let's go put that back. Okay, um, so what else do I need to do? Let's see. Um, I should probably run those unit tests to make sure that those uh, translations actually are doing what I expected them to do. Um, simple as running PHP unit. Now, if you had installed this um, locally to your machine um, and not through the Vagrant, um, you're going to have to go through setting up configuration files, um, installing it. Um, once again, big advocacy for VVV right here just because it works out of the box. All right. So let's get back to the deck a little bit. All right. So testing. Um, how do you know it works? Well, unit tests are a good start. Um, you know that if you've tested those strings and you've given it a large vocabulary, um, then you know if something failed. Um, for example, that test I wrote, or that function that I wrote, um, if I had ER, ER, ER in there, um, weird things could happen, right? Like there might be a case where I would catch something by testing large paragraphs of content um, that maybe I didn't think about when I was developing. And that's really the whole point of unit testing. Um, Smoke testing, that's a term I don't hear very much in the WordPress space, um, but it's, it's a pretty important part of a deployment pipeline. So basically this is, is it on fire? Did the site 500 after you made your change? Um, it can be as simple as just curling the website um, in a script. You know, do I get a 200 response back? Um, knowing that the code that I just pushed up to the world um, is currently working. Um, integration test, um, these are that Twitter example earlier. If I'm interacting with the Twitter API, um, I need to make sure that the contract between WordPress and Twitter um, maybe hasn't changed. Maybe Twitter updated their API. Um, so I should write some testing around there to make sure that what's coming back from the API um, matches what I expect to get. Um, don't do a lot of work on the front end, um, but something I've kind of been playing with a little bit. Uh, browser testing, most people know Selenium. Um, Capybara is a variant of that. Um, but this is automated browser testing. So what this allows to do is actually hits, uh, opens up Chrome um, and starts clicking around. You script um, basically um, a story. Like, I'm a user and I need to change my password. You can automate it to where it opens the window, signs in, goes to the user screen, populates it, finds the blank, drops down. Did it fail? Did it not fail? Um, and then lastly, all of these things can be done uh, continually through continuous integration. Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. I did get that set up uh, for the, the Boston Fire plugin. Um, and I think that maybe this is another place where it's just best to uh, show what it does. Um, so this is Travis CI. Um, another, another reason to uh, use GitHub or I do my plugin development with GitHub is it has an integration with Travis. Um, so basically what's going to happen is every time that I make a commit to my Git repo, um, Travis is going to observe the change and it's going to create a series of virtual environments and it's going to run PHPCS, it's going to run those unit tests. Um, if I've written integration test or smoke test, um, it would run all of those things. So that means that anybody who's brand new to the project come in and makes a mistake, this prevents it from hitting the outside world. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what these reports look like, um, I'm going to go down so I have a failing one here. Um, you can see that we're using different PHP versions, um, different versions of WordPress, etc. Um, so yeah, I mean, it looks a lot like a shell environment. Um, it's basically what it is. It's a, it's a virtual environment um, that spins up long enough to run the test, and then after it's done, it's destroyed. Um, but when you get a test failure like this, you get the output. And in this case, um, it was PHP CS. Uh, my unit test actually passed, and all my car to car stuff worked out just fine. Um, but I forgot to do some standard stuff here. Um, so this catches it. And um, really, really easy to set up. Uh, I think first time to ever do it probably took somewhere in the neighborhood of 
10, 15 minutes. Um, and if you create your plugin with VVVs, or I'm sorry, with WPCLI and use the scaffolding techniques, um, then it comes with the configuration file to feed into Travis automatically. Um, the structure is already correct. You just write your test and get going. All right, I think I'm done browser hopping for a bit. Um, okay, I can skip over this because we looked at it already. Um, but just the, the notion of a testable unit, small bite-sized functions um, that don't have large amounts of parameters that um, are dependencies, um, you know, make things bite-sized. Same thing, uh, it's easy to test if it's bite-sized. Um, another thing, enterprise-grade software should be extensible. Um, if you're going to write something, um, that's getting consumed by a large number of people, um, it's almost impossible to predict how they're going to use it. Um, you know, the Twitter widget, most people are probably going to serve tweets, but maybe someone else is using that for um, some other purpose. I'm trying to think of something real quick. Um, maybe like as a business tool or they're using it as a logger or some weird thing like that. Um, it's always good to add, add functions and hooks. Like that's what WordPress is amazing for. Um, is, is that's the way that the whole plugin system works, is you're hooking into different parts of WordPress core, because WordPress core, core is providing um, a way to make that extensible. Take that rule and apply that to your plugins. So before you return a value from a function, add a filter, say filter whatever that variable name is. And you may not do anything with it in your plugin and that's completely fine, um, but someone else who's gonna ingest that later might find that very beneficial and you will not have to have um, someone sending you a nasty email being like, hey, like I did this thing, or if you, maybe you sold that plugin, like, hey, why isn't this working? I pay good money for this. Now you're up at midnight and your family's mad at you. So if you just get out ahead of it, um, you know, it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, transition functions. Oh, yeah, my sense really. All right. Um, so hooks, actions, filters, use them. Lots of them everywhere. Can't have too many. Um, translation functions. Um, most of WordPress speaks in English at WordCamps, right? That's what most of us know. Uh, but it's an international community. I think I did some number looking one time and found that there's actually um, more consumers of WordPress in non-English countries than there are now. Um, so what this means is that you should translate all your strings um, so that other people can use it, right? It's um, you know, to the idea of the enterprise again, um, you know, enterprise generally probably touches uh, multiple you know, uh, nation, nation, nations. Um, so it's good. And then accessibility. Um, you know, both of these topics get covered quite a bit, and I don't want to you know, go into them too much. Um, but much in the same way that not everybody speaks English, um, not everybody um, has the same physical form or experience, make things accessible to other people. Um, one of the best developers or a collaborator in their future could be on a teletype machine. Make sure that they can navigate your code and that it, um, it's friendly, you know? Democratize that publishing. All right. Scalability. Um, so this is the one that probably most people think about uh, when you're talking about uh, enterprise-grade software. Um, I would like to reiterate, though, that it's, it, that's not it. Um, each of these things is equally as important. Um, and I would say that you don't actually have quality software unless you're doing all of them. Uh, but scalability, right? So cash, 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 cash. Um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but we have a little joke uh, at my employer. Um, that sometimes we're in the business of not running WordPress. Um, the idea there is, is that every time, like WordPress is actually not terribly performant. Um, like without a cache layer, you can't scale a WordPress site um, up to, and I'm gonna keep using that like million page views number, um, it won't work, right? So what you need to do, um, if you don't have dynamic content, um, set up a page cache. Um, you can use something like Varnish. Um, most of um, the managed WordPress hosting will have some version of a cache layer um, you can interact with, and then WordPress also has functions uh, for leveraging that. Um, there's very simple plugins that you can add on top for page caching, and so page caching is basically just it takes the rendered output of the page, saves it to memory, next time the second person shows up, it serves that. Um, no dynamic content here though, so like for example, like a WooCommerce store or something, uh, you don't really want to page cache that, because you're going to serve someone else's cart uh, to a different person, and they're going to have a bad experience. Um, Object caching is the way that you can address that, though. So object caching is storing a fragment, um, taking an expensive lookup. Um, let's say that you have an outbound request to an API somewhere. Um, back to our million page views uh, example. If that API is being hit a million times um, on the front end by every user that you have, 
Um, you're probably going to get rate limited, probably going to break the site, you're probably getting a nasty letter. Um, but the way you can do is you can use um, WordPress caching functions. You can hit that API one time and then save it. You can save it to memory. Um, WordPress also has a way to store that in the database, um, but I really recommend using something like Redis um, or Memcache. And if you uh, go through the plugin repo, um, there's all sorts of uh, plugins that interact with these things. All right, back to the let's not get too clever. Um, everybody know what a ternary function is? Yeah, show of hands. All right, um, so a ternary function uh, is basically a one-line way to write in if-then-else conditional. Um, it's pretty, so instead of you know having four blocks of code or four lines of code for um, for a very simple conditional, um, it takes it down to one. Um, but then you can get too clever. You can nest these, and then you can nest those. So you can actually end up with an if-then-else, 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 all in one line, and you feel smart, uh, but nobody else knows what any of that stuff means. So don't do it. Um, and then back to uh, you know regex. You know I, I, I'm going to keep harping on that example. Um, sometimes uh, the more complicated solution is actually the worst solution, uh, especially at scale. Um, so this gets into the, uh, this is an object caching example. Um, so in this one right here, um, so what this is, get back to our Boston of Fire site real quick. I did add a picture of uh, Boston there for you guys. I thought you were going to go down. All right. Really love this theme. It's such a good job. Okay. Um, so uh, that is not what's supposed to happen. Um, so if you remember from our, uh, our PHP code sniffs that happened, um, I got all those errors about, actually, I'll just go back, toggle back over there so we can revisit that. Um, I'm sorry. OK, you know what I think? OK, so anyway, oh, I know where it was. It was in Travis. That's where it failed. OK, so um, missing function document, missing function document, et cetera. Um, so anyway, I escaped things in the widget that I shouldn't have escaped um, on the site, but we're just going to glance over that and pretend that that's rendering uh, correctly. Uh, but what it is, is it's, um, it's basically it's, uh, the REST API endpoint for, um, for this conference and um, basically stores it um, in memory. And the ways that you can do that are actually very simple. Um, so you can kind of ignore uh, the route part of that. That's just a variable that was necessary to make this work. Um, but you have a response. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask WordPress, do you have this in your cache somewhere? Have we ever asked for this information before? First pass, it's going to say, no, we don't know what that is. Response is empty. All right? So what should we do? It's like, well, let's make that API request. Um, WP Safe Remote Git is also a really great function that doesn't get used often enough. Um, a lot of, most of the stuff you'll find uses like um, this WP Remote Git, um, but this one has uh, some protections in it. Uh, will prevent uh, high um, retry times, uh, things like that, um, kind of in that scope of being enterprise grade. Sometimes there's an equivalent function that'll perform a little bit better. Um, but then after we make that API call, uh, let's save it. Save it to response. Next time we hit this page, um, it's going to be in cache, and we don't have to worry about hammering um, the source. All right, collaboration. Um, I think that probably an enterprise like this doesn't, you don't really think a, a, a lot of enterprise entities in the world are, are closed source. Um, you know, they feel like they have invested millions of dollars into creating a software product and it's maybe not something that they feel comfortable opening up or sharing or especially GPIing. Um, but WordPress doesn't play by that rule. And it's been very successful. I would say it's been one of the core tenants of why it's so successful. And what you're seeing now, I think, uh, especially with things like the REST API, coming in um, is it's now at a, it, it's a mature enough software um, to kind of question uh, Adobe, for example. Like there are, there are consumers out there um, that use Adobe CMS. I didn't even know Adobe had a CMS because I don't have the kind of money that could afford it. Um, it's not my market, right? Um, but through WordPress and through collaboration, you can get your people involved, right? Um, you know, even if this is collaboration just internally or inside your group with the team, um, you know, your internal collaborators, um, you know, make sure that they care or, you know, get them in the discussion. Um, make sure that your work's available, GitHub. Um, market your work. This is one that people don't do very often. If you are aspirational and you're trying to sell a plugin to 100,000 people, um, build it and they will come does not work most of the time. Um, there's a lot of really, really great stuff out there that nobody knows about. 
um, you're gonna have to put on that marketing hat, you're gonna have to self-promote, you're gonna have to write a blog article, um, get eyes on it. And then later, maybe someone comes in and does something smarter than what you had done. Then we're inching towards uh, scalability and security and you know, building a plugin or a theme that can serve million page views. Um, and consider not just an international audience, um, but your whole audience. Um, so just to recap, um, you know, what, what are the things that I think, you know, this is all my opinion, right, um, that make enterprise grade development? Um, you know, it boils down to best practices, modern tooling, um, test, 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 and then continuously test, um, making it extensible so everybody can um, leverage the great work that you've done, make sure that it scales, um, and also make it available. So that's about what I've got. Um, I'm gonna take, I've got how many minutes? Four minutes for questions. There was one that came in last night though, um, from Andy, and I'm just gonna say yes. <laughs> All right, and now to real questions. Anybody have anything on their mind? Um, yeah, so, um, let me go back to my first slide. I don't have them available online right now, but if you follow me on Twitter, um, and I'm gonna go back to that, that opening slide so you can uh, get that information, I will post that uh, before the afternoon's up. Um, also, I've got, to, um, I've got a panel after this, but I'm uh, very open to any questions. If you have something you don't want to ask in the room, um, you gotta give me an hour, but after that, um, find me walking around out here. I'm happy to talk about anything on your mind. Um, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Uh, just kind of a, a random question, some, somewhat related, but I see that you, you work at WPN, and where I work, we actually do post a lot of sites on there. Um, now, I was one, one of, I, I, I've been pretty happy with it, but I, was, I, I always wish that there would be like a uh, shell access. Is there any plans that kind of shell access so we can't use tools like uh, the CLI? Um, actively developed on the roadmap, be done soon. Yes? Uh, is there any way to customize like, the scaffolding with the CLI? Um, you know, uh, so the question was, is, like, is there any way to, to customize the scaffolding? Um, I do know there's a number of parameters that you can take in there. I don't know if you can create your own scaffolds, um, but I would assume so. Um, I would have to crack open that piece of WP CLI, but that's what I would do, is I would just see how they're doing it. Um, and then, yeah, make your own tool. You know, back to the tooling thing, like, right? Tools are great. Tools save time, they save your butt. Um, make more, make more tools. More tools the merrier. Cool, I think I'm about out of time. Thank you guys for uh, letting me come back. Um, I really do love this city, it's good to be here. Thank you.